Thanksgiving, good food and good fellowship with family and friends, and uh, enjoyed this festive period of time. Won't be long, we're going to have another one, and then we get to look into a whole new year. My, my, isn't this time flying? I do appreciate Larry and uh, Tommy for filling in for me in my absence last Sunday. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to go see the family in East Texas, first time in quite a few years. And so that meant a lot to me, and I do appreciate that. Before we get into our lesson this morning, let's bow for a prayer. Count Father, thank you so much for an opportunity to be here today. And Father, we pray that we will have a heart and mindset for Thanksgiving. That we might be thankful every day for all of the many blessings that you pour out upon us. Not only, Father, for the physical blessings that we enjoy that makes our life a little bit more comfortable, but especially the spiritual blessings in Christ. Now go with us through this effort today to encourage us, to study, to understand how important being uh, thankful in our life truly is. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know this may be a little bit late since uh, I wasn't here last week and didn't get to preach. I'm going to go ahead and do my Thanksgiving sermon today. And we're going to talk about prayers of thanksgiving. There was a preacher went bear hunting. He stood on the side of a mountain and looked down and there was a huge grizzly. He began to take aim and he got a little bit closer to the edge and he still looking down that mountain at that bear through his scope. Got a little bit too close to the edge. The edge gave away and here he goes rolling, tumbling all the way down and landed right at the feet of that bear. Immediately since he landed kind of on his knees, he went into the praying position and said, Lord, please may this be a Christian bear. The bear dropped down on his big, powerful knees, folded his big paws, and he says, Kind Father, thank you for this meal I'm about to receive. <laughs> now there's two ways you can go with that. First of all, be careful what you pray for. The other is a prayer of thanksgiving. We should always have a prayer of thanksgiving. You know, I think it's great that our nation sets aside one day especially to give thanks. But as Christians, Father, when I read my Bible, I get something different. That is not just one day that we are to be thankful. It is every day. In fact, I want us to look at, first of all, Ephesians 5 and verse 20. Ephesians 5 verse 20. A passage that you will recognize. It said, And be not drunk with wine in which is disputation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now watch this. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giving thanks to God always for all things. Now, when you use that word all, that's pretty that's pretty uh, inconclusive. I mean, that's everything. So what I want us to do is think for a few moments everything we could include in our lives as that all. You know, one of the things that the Bible teaches us that we need to be contented. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Those that are truly content are going to be very thankful for the things that they have. Those who are discontented in their life are going to be miserable, unhappy in the things that they have. They're going to be looking at those things that they don't have, those things they wish they had. You see, they live in this world where they think that life would be better if they had more or had something a little bit different. 
That is a miserable way to live. We are to be happy in what we have been granted by God. The things that we enjoy. Now, that we might give thanks always for all things. Again, I would encourage you at some point to consider every blessing that you have to be thankful for. And good luck with the time on that. We should be thankful for our redemption. Look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. And by the way, if you want to do a very interesting phrase study, look at the word giving thanks to God in the New Testament. How many times that's used by men like the Apostle Paul and Peter? Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints of life. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. First of all, we're partakers of the divine inheritance. Now, how'd that happen? How did God prepare us? Well, that's what He talks about in verses 13 and 14. He prepared us by delivering us from the power of darkness. The power of darkness represents the evil kingdom. Represents Satan. And the powers of darkness. We have been brought out of those, those, the lives of darkness. That which is separated from God. And we have been brought into, translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. He prepared us for our inheritance by first of all, sending His Son... That through our faith and our obedience, we might be translated out of this world of darkness and into the kingdom of His dear Son. Now, the only way that we could have enjoyed this transition is through the coming of Jesus Christ. Without the coming of Christ, we would not have any hope. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Watch this, verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You know, I know I've talked to a lot of people who plan upon their death to leave quite an inheritance to their children. And that's commendable. My children inherit all my debts. That's the way I like it. No, I'm, I'm kidding, kids. I'm kidding. That's commendable. I'm like more like the guy that said, you know, he's got the bumper sticker on his car. I'm spending my, my children's inheritance. I like that better. But, you know, we think about that and, you know, we'd, we'd like to, to do that and leave our kids something. But, folks, I, want, I hope if, if I could leave them a ton of money, a good business, a lot of land, but if they lose their souls... What have I truly gained? What I want to leave my children is I want to leave them with faith. I want to leave them with an inheritance that won't fade away, that is incorruptible. But I'm not going to do that simply by talking about it because I have got to show them that incorruptible life. You see, that's what Paul is saying when he talks about this translation out of darkness. You know, the darkness represents the world. <laughs> a lot of people, they can't let go. They want to hang on to the world, at least some parts of the world. 
And they, they won't, they don't have the faith to let go of the world to enjoy true faith and confidence in the Lord. In the kingdom, we've got to let go. We've got to live in the light, walk in the light, as Jesus Christ is in the light, and have fellowship one with the other, as the blood of Christ continues to cleanse us. 1 John 1, verse 7. We're translated into the kingdom. Yes, we are. There's a big movement, and there's been a big movement for many, many years, that the kingdom has not been yet established. So my question is, if the kingdom has not yet been established, how then, past tense, have we been translated into the kingdom? One of the blessings and the most wonderful privileges we have is the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Jesus said, I will build my church. And then he tells Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. These two words are used interchangeably throughout the New Testament. What is the kingdom? The kingdom is the church. We are translated into the church. How are we translated into the church? Through baptism. As we're baptized into Christ, we're baptized into His body. What is His body? The body is the church. What is the church? The church is the kingdom. What is the kingdom? It is the eternal home of the saved. Acts 2.47 He added to the, to the church daily such as being saved. The kingdom will be gathered with the Father. Now, folks, we know that the church is not this building. Church is the family. But I want to tell you something. We should have a wonderful love for coming together with God's people. I don't see how anyone could despise being together with God's people. would rather do anything else than being with God's people and serving God and worshiping God and studying God's Word and praying together. And that closeness, that fellowship, that union we enjoy. Folks, if you're not going to enjoy that on earth, what makes you think you're going to enjoy heaven? We should be so thankful for the church, for the kingdom of God that He's established. Because, as I've already mentioned, that's the vehicle of our salvation as we are baptized into that body of Christ. Now, this kingdom belongs to the Son, the Son being Jesus Christ. We translate in the kingdom of His dear Son. Do not be negative and despise Jesus Christ. Neither should we despise the kingdom because it's his body. Now, how would we do that? What if we talk negative or despise God's people? What if we gossip about God's children? The Bible is very explicit on what we should do if we have it all against a brother. And it is not going behind their back and talking to others. We should be thankful for God's people. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. This light that we are, that we now enjoy. Light's comforting. You know, when a person's sick, it seems like the nights just drag out. And then the morning begins to, to break and you begin to see a little light around the windows. It feels good. You feel warmer. You feel better. And as it grows lighter, the better you feel. The kingdom is called light for a reason. Because Jesus Christ is called light. John chapter 1. In him was the light. Watch. And the light was the life of 
men. We should be thankful that we get to share in the life of Christ, to share in the light of Christ. Ephesians 5 and verse 8, For you were once in darkness. Everyone who is a Christian in this building at some point lived in darkness. Before you became a Christian, you were in darkness. Some people become so acclimated to the darkness, they don't even realize they're in darkness. But then they hear the better way. They hear the gospel plan of salvation. And they're, they're awestruck at the very fact that that gospel of Jesus Christ talks about their salvation. And the release from that bondage of sin. And become a Christian through obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ by being baptized and repenting. And all of a sudden they realize they, they had been in darkness and now they are in light. And by the way, once we have become in the light, we become light givers. The word is illuminaries. Ye are, Jesus said, the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a, a, a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candle stand that everybody in the house can see its light. Therefore, he says, let your light so shine among men that may see your good works. Let your light shine. We are light givers, and we need to be thankful that we are light givers. And by the way, one of the things that happens is the influence that we have. I, I am so thankful for my brothers and sisters for the influence that they have of light. I dearly love to be out in the community to hear someone say, you've got a lot of good people in that congregation. That bodes well for this congregation. It's sure a lot better than saying, boy, you got a bunch of stinkers up there. I've been in places like that before too. You know, you got, you got some good people up there. You got people that really believe in their Christianity. That really means a lot to me. Because that lets me know we're shining our lights. And I am so thankful for people with that kind of commitment. That means we're thankful for God's family. As I mentioned, the kingdom of the church, 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, if I'm delayed, I write to you that you may <clears throat> pardon me, know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the family of God, the church, which is the pillar and the ground of truth. The family of God, which is the church. Hello, family. You know, over the past week, it's been a beautiful experience to be a family. I have seen family that I haven't seen in years. I'm talking five years, six years. And, and it, it was like with some of them, it was like yesterday. When we're back together, we were just like, we've never been separated. Isn't it awesome to be able to be with our family? Do we have that kind of love for our church family? Do we have that kind of appreciation for our church family? I think that's one of the reasons why David would say, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. He wanted to worship. He loved to worship God. He was thankful for the privilege of being able to go to worship his God. But then there is that being together in fellowship with God's people, God's family. To have that in common. You know, I'm finding out the older I get, the less in common I have with the world. I have friends in the world. I do. I've got good friends in the world. But they're not my best friends. My best friends are sitting in this building. 
And I believe, Christian, that's the way it ought to be. If we have more in common. What was it that Solomon said about iron sharpening iron? Can two walk together? Amos said, if there's no agreement. You see how important it is for us to enjoy the fellowship one with another as Christians. The encouragement. How many of you know what the word Barnabas means? You know what the word Barnabas means? Go ahead, raise your hand if you, if you know what it means. A few hands. The word Barnabas means the encourager. It wasn't just his name. It was what Barnabas did. You remember there was a fellow that was converted. People were afraid of him. He'd been persecuting the church. In fact, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the church. The man's name was Saul. And a nice baptized Saul. And when Saul went back to Jerusalem, guess who took him to the brethren? Barnabas. Because they probably wouldn't have received him. But Barnabas encouraged Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, and encouraged the brethren. He was like the peacemaker between. I am so thankful for God's family that we have those kinds of encouragers. Every one of you right now, if I were to say who's an encourager in your life, there's someone in this congregation that stands out. God bless them. I'm so thankful for these people because we need encouragement. We're in this world. We can't escape the world until the final call. And as long as we're in the world, we're going to get beat around. We're going to get kicked down. We need those encouragers to build us up. And I'm so thankful. And the ability and the, and, the, and the greatness of having more than one encourager, which I do, is just amazing. I am so thankful for God's family. I want to be with God's family every chance I have to enjoy that fellowship and that encouragement. I do not look for reasons not to be here. Because I've got too many reasons to be here. Unconditional love. I think my church family knows me about as well as my family. And there's times and I can be a little bit difficult. At least that's what my wife tells me. And I'm sure maybe some of you think that there are times whenever I can be a little bit difficult. But you know what? You love me anyway. I hope you do. Years ago I heard this phrase, warts and all. All the deformities of our bodies, we, if we have this unconditional love, we're going to love in spite of. We overlook. I'm so thankful for that unconditional love that people have for me. Overlooking the human part. Overlooking the faults. Overlooking the warts. And seeing me as a brother in Christ. I'm thankful for our call to serve. Colossians 3 and verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all, do all, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Watch this. Giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Giving thanks. Whatever you're doing, do it with all your heart. Do it as for God and not men. But remember this. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful that we have the opportunities to serve. Be thankful that we have these opportunities 
to take advantage of helping others around us. Helping our brothers and sisters when they're down. Helping people in the world to find the gospel. To learn the gospel. We have been called to serve. In Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now I want you to think about that for a moment. Okay, what is a sacrifice? We go back to the Old Testament. Sacrifice was something slaughtered. The blood actually has escaped the body of the sacrifice. And it's used in the, the worship, representing, of course, the sins being washed of the people. But it's only temporary. Every year they had to offer the sacrifice. Every year they had to let blood from these sacrificial animals. Every year. Because they were looking forward to something bigger and better and more wonderful. Every year these animals had to be put to death. Can you imagine on the day of, of uh, the Passover in Jerusalem, how many animals would have to be put to death? I, I have heard that there were actual ditches throughout Jerusalem that on the day of the Passover would run bank full or over bank with the blood of these sacrificial animals. Animals would be offered for somewhere in the neighborhood of 20,000 people. And yet every year it was the same thing. But now... Through Jesus Christ. He's offered his blood one time. And that's enough. That's the blood of our salvation. That blood being shed by those animals was looking forward to the blood of Christ. Isn't God wonderful? Isn't God wonderful the way he has devised and designed a plan of salvation? Now here's the other thing. Our bodies are not those dead, lifeless sacrifices. Our bodies are living sacrifices to God. Our bodies belong to God. When you have sometimes, sometimes, read 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul talks about the fact that our body doesn't belong to ourselves, that our bodies belong to Christ. Oh, actually, 1 Corinthians 6, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about our bodies belonging to the Lord. They're not ours. If we truly believe that, it would be so, such a different thing. So, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. And then he goes on to say, Do not be conformed to this world, because we've been delivered from it. Why do you want to live in the filth and the garbage of the world that we've escaped from? Paul even, or Peter even talked about this, having escaped the corruption that's in the world. Having escaped that corruption in the world, why do you want to go back to it? Therefore, he goes on to say, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind. You know, I had a young man ask me one time, What happens at baptism? And, of course, I gave him the answer. Well, we're, we're saved by the blood of Christ. We're added to the church. No, 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 no. He said, I, I know all that. That's not what I mean. What happens in baptism? And for the first time it hit me, that question probably could be asked by any number of Christians. What actually happens in baptism? What happens to my life? I said, well, we are changed. We become a new creation, not just a creature. We have become a new creation. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. With that in mind, when we come out of the waters of baptism, we are different. We are born again. You know, that is that transformation. We're different. Christian. Coming out of the waters of baptism, we are not the same as we were. We have 